It's Sunday, July 10, 2022. Welcome to the 22nd episode in this series from Midas Touch and 5-Minute News called The Weekend Show, where we take a deep dive into the news of the week. You can download the show as audio in addition to my daily 5-Minute News podcast on iTunes or wherever you get yours. Joining me today is former Trump campaign aide who has repeatedly taken on Trump in the courts to invalidate his NDA for former staffers, Jessica Denson. Jessica, hi. Thank you for joining us uh, here on The Weekend Show. You uh, have a very interesting story. Not many people take on the might of the, the Trump organization or the Trump campaign. or And we hear about these non-disclosure agreements and you know we hear about the kind of controlled environment that Donald Trump and his people prefer. Just tell us a little bit about um, how you first kind of got in touch with his organization or certainly his campaign and what drew you to want to work for him? Well, thank you for having me, Anthony. Um, I lived in a vortex of, of misinformation, of gaslighting, of division and fear mongering, otherwise known as Fox News. And I lived in that vortex increasingly um, beginning in the beginning of Obama's administration, and just getting sucked deeper and deeper in through those eight years. And so when 2016 came around, um, I saw Donald Trump as um, a political outsider, which I think is one of the one of the largest cons that he's perpetuated because he lived and breathed politics his whole life. This is how this man survived by sheer political will um, and using the system in the way that we hate politicians to use the system. So he's actually the ultimate political insider. But of course, I bought into the con. I bought into the facade of him being a political outsider and um, and having been someone who followed politics, but um, also like to consider myself kind of uh, very independent and even a rebel in, in certain respects. I saw him like a lot of people did kind of the way some people had uh, have viewed Boris Johnson in the UK as this this, you know, renegade outsider who was going to bring about change that others were not willing to um, willing to for the good of the people. And so I jumped on the Trump train um, pretty early on, probably late 2015. Um, <laughs> I I accepted that this man was flawed because I thought that he was authentic. And you know what, Anthony, I think that's these are the two biggest cons that he still gets away with, political outsider and authentic. So I believe that he was authentic. Another totally false notion. Um, this man is just lives and breathes lies. He can't speak a truth to save his life. So um, I thought, OK, he's flawed, but he's authentic. You know, he says things in public that other people say in private. And, you know, we all do it. And so I gave him I gave him a pass on on some of the more um, horrific and horrendous things that he said. And I eventually in the summer of 2016 um, got a job, got a job on the Trump campaign, uh, originally on a very low level in, a, in the data department. But within a couple of weeks, I did a translation project for Steve Bannon um, uh, from English to Spanish for the Mexican president. Uh, if you remember in 2016, Trump went to Mexico to meet with Peña Nieto and they had a agreed upon speech that had to be made by both parties. And Bannon had a copy of Peña Nieto's speech in English, but he needed it translated to Spanish so he could follow along in real time and make sure that Peña Nieto followed along with this agreed upon dialogue. And I translated it overnight, I sat next to Bannon while, while we listened. And I told Bannon, I said, there's this one line where I'm pretty sure he's gonna deviate. And sure enough, I was right, he deviated on that very line. And so Bannon said, what are you doing in the data department? Come with us. I was promoted um, to lead the Hispanic engagement effort. They really did not have a cogent uh, campaign-based Hispanic engagement effort prior to my arrival on that campaign. So I mobilized that whole thing on my own. Um, fast forward, <laughs> my old boss from Data and um, a new rival in the Hispanic engagement realm um, launched a pretty aggressive and terrorizing assault on me. And when I brought this to the attention of the campaign, they further retaliated 
um, I had a nightmare experience on that campaign, feeling like the entire weight of that campaign was weighing on my shoulders. Um, I was uh, accused of federal crimes, le leaking Trump's taxes, uh, shopping bids to the media, all just f false accusation one after another, and um, left that campaign in tatters and in fear and lived with this for a year and um, very much wanted to walk away. And I didn't, an interesting tidbit is that I never during that, that experience blamed it on Trump himself because my personal interactions with the man were fairly positive. He actually, um, in retrospect, he said some very misogynist things to me, but at the time I found him relatively respectful and very appreciative of my work. So I was reluctant to hold him personally responsible. It took getting distance. Um, it took educating myself. It took comparing my experience with other horrific experiences of assaults on public servants who were just trying to help this country to see what a dangerous man he was and what a dangerous con he had he had sold this country on. Um, but anyway, a year after, I, I was very much wanting to walk away. I'm, I'm an introspective person. I'm a person who can forgive. And, and I very one, much wanted to believe that that was the course that I needed to take. And I, this is interesting. This is really interesting. I had decided not to take action a year later. We're in 2017 now. And Donald Trump was in, he was in South Korea, I believe giving a speech about light shining in the darkness. Now, of course, Anthony, we know Donald Trump doesn't write his own speeches, right? <laughs> this is one of these great speeches that was written for him talking about, you know, democracy in America being the light that's shining in darkness. It was, there was a lot, of, um, a lot of discussion in the news at the time about North Korea and the ominous, you know, just the threat and the darkness and the oppression of a country like North Korea. And I listened to that speech and it was in conjunction with kind of an identity crisis that I was having where I thought, okay, I'm going to walk away from this. And it wasn't, it just wasn't feeling right. It was not jiving. And that speech that he gave about light shining in darkness, not his, not his heart, but words out of his mouth was one of the last things that inspired me to act. Wow. And that night, I, I mean, I, I cried so many tears. I woke up in the morning not recognizing myself because my face was so worn from what I had, this kind of internal wrestling that I had gone through the night before. And I got my computer out. I typed up a complaint. I had, I had outreached to a few lawyers, but it was really too late. It was too late to get a legal team at this point. My, my one-year statute of limitations were about to expire on certain claims. And I drafted up a complaint. I went to New York Superior Court and I filed my first lawsuit, <laughs> the first of what is now three, and I've been in two arbitrations. And this is this is the path. Totally, I had no idea that this would happen whatsoever, no expectation that this would be the course, but this is the path that has led me to invalidate Donald Trump's non-disclosure agreement in court. It, it, I mean, it's a fascinating story. and and. I'm I'm really interested in each individual's personal relationship with the with the Trump concept because you know he is a brand right a walking talking brand he even refers to himself in the third person and I I I think you have to be very careful of people like that you know because it suggests that the ego is is so gross and gauche that you know you're not dealing with just an ordinary normal person and I'm also fascinated of course in in because in England, we refer to Americans as being quite gullible. You know, that's like a it's a kind of funny thing that we refer to. You know, every every nation has a has a, a character trait. And we think of Americans, not all Americans, obviously, but some Americans as being gullible. Uh, I actually think it's contributed to the success of the economy here. You know, like you're told that this razor shaves as close as a blade and you buy it, you know, whereas in England, we'd be like, prove it, you know. So just we just have a slightly different attitude. But I'm just very interested at the point at which as a as a um, as a conservative or as a Republican or as a Trump fan or a not a Trump fan that people's radar goes, hang on a second, this is not normal. 
Like, this is nuts. And I think that it's... We'll get into this conversation, but it's this kind of version of civility that I find very interesting. You know, what is normal? What is that line of of normality? Um, Whereby when we cross into the kind of... Into another realm, that is the Trump world. And he talked always about draining the swamp. And that, of course, was projection. Because he was the swamp. Everything is projection. Everything. Yeah, I think, you know, I I don't think you can have this conversation without talking about right wing media, because you say that they just excuse, you know, the most they've they've normalized these really horrible behaviors. But on the same token, on the same token, they they will totally criticize and blame people on the left for the most minor transgressions and blow them out of proportion. So you have this, you have this microcosm where, where people are being mentally malpracticed on a daily basis. And what, what, what an organization like Fox does is they, they portray the Democrats as evil. Okay. Not political opponent opponents, evil. These are evil people who want to destroy this country. Okay, so first of all, they are their number one MO is fear mongering. Okay, they are after you. The other people are after you. Which is, of course, not based in any truth no. because no. No. it's not Democrats who own or do mass shootings. Right. It's, it's not Democrats who are out to infringe people's rights. No. It's 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 so obvious that one is a goodie and one is a baddie when it comes to intellectualizing their policies. And yet you're right. There is this ability that right wing media has. And it's not just Fox. I mean, I sat through all of them yesterday. I, I, I have a an app that takes me you know, through all of these channels. And I was like, wow, there's like six or seven now of these news news channels mm-hmm. that are spewing propaganda. And the thing that makes it so compelling is if you see a story presented on Fox and then you switch to uh, AON or to Newsmax, they corroborate the story with different newscasters. And I guess that if you're in that environment, you therefore assume it must be true because more than one channel is talking about it. Do you think that conservatives realize that these channels are uh, propaganda channels? Do you think there is a kind of cognitive understanding that, yeah, okay, I'm watching a right-wing network? No. I, I think for many of them, there is not. I, I think there's probably some some gray space in there. But I think for their devotees, they are largely, this is the way that I felt. I'm going to tell you how I felt. And this is so tragic, Anthony. You, you are a journalist. I also have a background in journalism. That was my education. So this is such a trap. I'm, I'm telling you but this. But it's not your fault, no, Jessica. I mean, this is very this interesting. Is and this is why. understand how aggressive this is. So this is, the, yeah. this is my mentality. And, and understand in, in Obama years, there wasn't OAN. Or if there was, it was in its inception. So it, I was really Fox for me. But yeah. um, I this is the way they portrayed it. OK, Obama and the Democrats and now, you know, Biden and the Democrats are doing all these evil things and the mainstream media, right? The lamestream, you know, <laughs> M- MSLSD, as they call yeah. it, yeah. are not telling you the truth. They're not yeah. even being journalists. They're not yeah. doing, you know, so here we are, Fox News, this righteous arbiter of truth and, and you know, dogged reporting, we are bringing you the facts. We are, you know, they have this heinous, tagline at the bottom of Tucker Carlson's show of all shows now that you know what it says? You know. What does it say, Anthony? It says standing up for what's right. That's right. Oh That's my right. God, yeah. here's Fox News. But it's a, it's a very God. clever play, isn't it? It's a very clever play because <laughs> the attitude of all of these shows, especially the likes of Tucker Carlson and Hannity and Laura Ingram, yeah. is we know something that the other side exactly. doesn't. That is it. We are the in crowd. Exactly. We are tipping you off. Yes. We found this out. Yes. Nobody else knows this. Yeah. We we are you are now privy to this 
this yeah. clever, you know, information that yeah. we are, we have gathered, exactly. and and it, and it and it is clever. Yeah. And I, you know, I have interactions with people who I know. I have a I've spoken on this show several times about my Trump supporting landlord, who is uh, is a, a font of entertainment for me. Uh, last night he again came over and uh, told me that. Uh, I've drunk the Kool-Aid. <laughs> and and it's so funny to me because he's drunk so much Kool-Aid that he he's, you know, he's blinded by it. And and that's why I'm so interested in this point at which normal becomes abnormal. And I guess if you're in Trump's orbit, you're living in this kind of criminal fraternity. You know, it's like a mob environment. And, I, you know, if you've read anything about mobs or cults even, and I did an interview with Steve Hassan, who wrote the book The Cult of Trump, and I, I do recommend that uh, episode. And that's why I say to you, Jessica, that it's not your fault, because even the smartest, most educated, clued up people have vulnerability. And yeah. it's that vulnerability that, that is, um, is the kind of connective tissue for joining in with this stuff. Yeah, um, I, think it's, I think it's really important uh, always to people want to see this in a political context. But I'm sure Rick Hassan talked about this. This is not this is not a political dilemma that we're dealing with. It's a social dilemma. Yeah. It's a human dilemma. Yeah. And, 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 and this is it's interesting you say about politics, because yeah. I, I saw a, a teacher being interviewed on one of these uh, right wing news channels yesterday. And she was saying, you know, they, they were asking her about, you know, teaching about, uh, you know, gender identity in class. And she was saying that we have to keep all politics out of the classroom. And I was like, wow, this is so clever. She thinks that gender identity is political. And it's not political. It's not political anywhere else that operates in that kind of normal space of how the world operates. I didn't choose to be male. Uh, you didn't choose to be female. This happened to us. And in the same way as if you're trans, you didn't choose to be trans. And so it's very interesting to me how subjects have been politicized in America and have been kind of galvanized by right wing media into being something other than ordinary. And, and you know, our bodies, our, our decision to, to have a baby or not have a baby, I mean, these things should not really be political, uh, especially if they have a religious connotation. You know, the Constitution suggests that it's not for the Supreme Court to push a, a religious view on people, and yet abortion or anti-abortion is fundamentally a religious view. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. Let's. Um, I just want to bring in some of the subjects that we're going to look at today. There's um, three subjects, as we always do on this show. Um, we're going to talk about um, uh, Joe Biden condemning the extreme Supreme Court majority that ended the constitutional right to abortion. He's actually signed an executive order in the last few days. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at that. Um, I also want to talk about uh, the... Um, uh, accelerating Justice Department investigation into the fake electors scheme to help Trump overturn the uh, election. There's a lot of interest now in Jeffrey Clark, Rudy Giuliani and John Eastman, the uh, three amigos, as I like to call them. And uh, finally, we're going to look to the UK and to Boris Johnson, who uh, famously Trump called Britain Trump, which is not actually a sentence. So um, we'll uh, we'll we'll look at that. Um, first, I want to mention uh, something that uh, happened uh, very late on Thursday night, U.S. time, Friday, early Friday morning this week. And that is the assassination of Shinzo Abe, the former prime minister and um, towering political figure in Japan. Of course, he was shot dead while giving a campaign speech on Friday morning at the age of 67. And um you know, he was very close to a lot of uh, presidents, you know, Japan and, and the US kind of kept very, uh, you know, a tight relationship. And it's kind of ironic that Japan is the safest, one of the safest countries in the world. You know, handguns are banned. You can't buy a gun. You can't buy ammunition without having to jump through a whole bunch of hoops. They don't have gun crime. You know, they don't, they, it just doesn't happen. It's not a thing. And consequently, politicians, even ones as significant as Shinzo Abe, they actually do stand on street corners without any security. You know, they stand on street corners and give speeches to crowds in a, in a very informal environment because they don't fear being shot. They don't have to stand in front of glass that's this thick to make a speech. And, I mean... There's some irony here, isn't there? Because obviously this is a, a week where we've seen um, mass, uh, a significant mass shooting in a Chicago suburb. 
Uh, and we're also hearing that the firearm that was used in this case may have been a, a homemade weapon, you know, downloaded from the Internet. The, the design, it looked like a kind of pipe with another pipe attached. And, and, you know, often these things don't work, but this thing really did work. It was two significant shots to the to the chest of Shinzo Abe. How do you feel about, you know, this this event and the timing with, uh, you know, what's been going on in the U.S. this week? Yeah, I think it's really, really tragic. I think uh, Shinzo Abe was a, um, you know, such a towering figure of diplomacy and really um, ushered Japan into a, a much larger role in global affairs and, and being inclusive in, in the global cause for democracy. So it's really, really sad. Um, I think, as you were saying, this just in the assassination itself, um, this highlights this stark, stark contrast that we have with a, a country like Japan, where, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, many forms of, of guns are just outright illegal. Um, they do not have this this sort of uh, gun violence that <laughs> they are almost unheard of. Um, and as you were saying, that's why this individual made a homemade ex- homemade gun. Um but what does it say for the U.S.? Because even if they were to ban assault weapons here, which I doubt will happen, but, you know, I mean, that because sh- well, they were banned, weren't they? And, uh, you know, that that ban was allowed to uh, to lapse. Um, and, and shootings, mass shootings went down during that period uh, that uh, assault weapons were banned here in the U.S. And these are weapons of war. I mean, you know, we're hearing from Chicago that this guy fired off, what was it, like 70 or 90 rounds in in just a a few seconds. I mean, this is not a gun that you would need to have for self-defense. And and the other thing people don't realize, and I hate to say it out loud, but the people that are killed by these weapons are unrecognizable. These bullets basically explode inside the body and, and... you know, you have to use dental records to yes. identify some of the, the the victims of these types of shootings. And when it's children, it's just devastating. Yes. What? Just give me an insight into the mindset of conservatives who, despite knowing the damage that is done by these weapons, refuse to give any leeway on gun control. You know, I was I was thinking about this, Anthony, when you told me we were going to be discussing this. And I thought of I thought of something that I really think is true and I don't think is discussed nearly enough. First of all, I don't even want to pretend that that Republican politicians um, care because I'm beyond the point of believing that they really care about what's in the best interest of um, the American people. I think some of them individually do, but the party writ large is a fascist party that has shown itself quite willing to undermine um, the public interests of the public good for their own um, desire for power at all costs. So uh, beyond that, though, I, I was just thinking about Weapons are, these these uh, weapons are creating terror in our country. I mean, these are acts of terrorism that we are witnessing. And I think that the Republican Party is quite aware of this and is happy to use it to their advantage. Fear, they're, like I said, with Fox News, their MO is fear. They are not unhappy to uh, instill fear in their political opponents. But it's even um, parents of children. Oh. I mean, I saw there, were, there was one woman who got up. I, I forget, and I apologize for not knowing the detail, but she, she, was, uh, she, worked for the, she worked for the state and, you know, she was being interviewed or she was making a case, I think, in a, in a, in a courtroom or there was a hearing. And she was saying that she had grandchildren and she said, I would happily kill my own grandchildren for the right to maintain these firearms. And I was like, I I had to rewind it like a couple of times. I was like, did she actually say that out loud? I mean, how do you get to a point where as a human, you become so uncivilized, you become a a savage effectively? Is that what we are in America now? Just savages? No, Anthony, and here's here's a great thing that we can remind everybody watching the show. The majority of this country is not in that extreme savage corner. 
right? Just like so many issues, just like on the abortion issue, on, uh, you know, voting rights, gun safety, so many issues, the vast majority of this country is sane and is not brainwashed and is not radicalized. Um, so yes, we have an extremist problem. And as I was saying, I do not think that this Republican party in its current state of just complete moral bankruptcy is unhappy that they have, I don't wanna speak for all of them, but I think it serves them to have an extremist base because that extremist base is a threat to our civilization. It's a th I think about this, and I know we're going to talk about this more later, but we think about the potential for violence when and if charges are brought against Donald Trump. That's like a weapon they have. That is a very serious, ominous threat that prosecutors have, have believe me, been thinking about when they are thinking about charging Donald Trump and his co-conspirators. And so um, we, I just think it, it, it amplifies, it highlights our need to be courageous, to, to not let these terrorists scare us, um, scare us into not acting and taking the appropriate measures uh, that we have to take to protect ourselves, to, to protect our democracy. Yes, they are savages, but no, they are not the majority of, majority of who we are. They are not who we are. They are not America. Um, and but it's good to hear, isn't it? Because the problem is that the extremists actually shout the loudest. They do. And, and, and this is part of the problem. If you are exposed to right wing media and you are flicking through the channels, as I did, and you're seeing this repeated, this propaganda repeated, and then you see it in newspapers and just obviously social media is the biggest um, uh issue because it's in everybody's face and everybody gets a focused feed based on their interests and so nobody really gets to see what life is like outside of that and and, and it, what terrifies me is that the people that are angry and the people that have been fed all the wrong information about how you know who democrats are you know democrats don't want to take anybody's guns away it would be nice not to have weapons of war on the streets, that's for certain. But I, I read that there was something like 7 million AR-15 style rifles in circulation. And, and so, you know, even if you did ban them, it wouldn't stop anything, really. And that, and that is that, you know, the misinformation is such that these people who are swallowing it and digesting it are the ones with the weapons. They are the ones who are violent. They are the ones who are on the edge. They are dispossessed. They are angry. And my fear is that violence will be the result of any um, prosecution of their supreme leader. But, but Anthony, if we, if we are working from that standpoint, we have no moral authority. Yeah. We might as well just put up the white flag right yeah. now and walk away and shut Agreed. down. You know, we it was a nice try. You know, democracy <laughs> was a nice, yeah. but, it was but, a nice know, effort, but it's too hard. It's too hard. The extremists win, the terrorists win. All right, yeah. see you later. No. But that, that has happened in, in other countries. And I, and I fear that, um, you know, America does take democracy for granted because it's always been so magnificent and so protected and respected around the world. You know, people look to America's yeah. process. But what you uh, talked about, I, wanna, I really want to, I don't want to cut you yeah. off, but what you Go said ahead. about violence, um, yeah. I think that people are being a little bit short-sighted if they mm -hmm. think, if they're, they're afraid of that type of violence, which I think is, is something that we have to confront. We have to confront this fear. We have to be prepared for it. We have to say we're not going to tolerate it. I mean, if there is a mass murderer um, loose and we know who he is and we know that he's living on a golf course, let's just pick another state in California. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to go up and pick up that mass murderer, even if he has a cult following who's going to, you know, be and because and if they go out and start shooting people, then we're going to go arrest them, too. Right. All yeah. of the people that that um, are, that are engaged in crimes are going to be held accountable. Let's just have that as a st baseline. But what right. I wanted to say about something that a lot of people don't talk about nearly enough, and I think it's just it's a frightening concept. But we we're at a boiling point in this country. Um, we are at a boiling point. Um, if we do not, if we allow Republicans to take control in the midterms, um, I think we're we are on a downward spiral. 
um, that may may be very hard to reverse. And then God forbid a Republican in the White House in 2024 with the course that this party has um, made it very clear that it wants to take in the direction of fascism. And to somehow think that that course, let's just leave the prosecution aspect of Donald Trump out of it, to think that that course does not enrage, does not break this boiling point that we are at, where, where our rights, the, the, the desires and the will of the majority of the people is being overrun by a fascist, power-hungry minority who wants to set us back centuries. If you don't think that that's going to reach a boiling point, I think you need to think again. Yeah. And so we have some hard decisions to make now, and they're, they're hard now. But the more we project them into our future, the harder and they're going to get the worse the outcomes are going to be. Do you, do you think this is why Joe Biden is basically just saying vote? You know, this is his answer to everything at the moment, vote. And it's he's hoping answer. that there will be a huge mobilization of women, uh, yeah. maybe who had voted conservative previously and will, will hopefully vote uh, Democrat this time, because that's part of the problem, isn't it? It's like you might have some views that fit with one party and other views that fit with another party. But being a two party system, there's very little other space like we have in the UK to to put your cross on the ballot. So, I mean, what's the likelihood of conservatives jumping over to Democrat because they believe in a couple of the issues? Let's say it's gun control and and abortion uh, rights. Do you think that's even possible? I am less confident in in shifting uh, political, you know, shifting the balance as than I am in just motiva- motivating the base, motivating the yeah. coalition that put Biden in the White House in the first place and, and retaining that coalition, not losing them on these short term issues like inflation, which God yeah. forbid we do because people just have to deal with what's right in front of them. I, and it's a, it's a worldwide issue, you know, yeah, people are trying is. to pin it, it on it's, Biden, but it's, it's like it's, it's, it's in every country. It, yeah. Of course. Yeah. So um, I think that that you know, we had 80 million people come out for Biden in 2020. We can, we can, we need to think along those big number lines about voter turnout, you know, keep a list. If you, if you're, if you are, if you are concerned about your rights being taken away, about actual freedom being on the line, which it is, keep a list, put 10 numbers on it. I want you to find 10 people between now and the the voting registration deadline in your locality who are not registered. Find 10 people. And as many of those 10 people that you get to register to vote, try to get as many of them as possible to find 10 more people. It's extremely yeah. serious. This is a I know, I understand. And I, I feel that issue. what's, at, what's at stake is is the whole future of, of American yes. democracy. And, and, and I worry, though, that the Democrats haven't quite made that clear enough. And messaging has, has always been their problem. Yes. The other thing I wanted to ask you about is, do you think it's fair that the media has already consigned the midterms as a loss for the Democrats? You know, you turn on any channel and they're, and they're saying, well, of course, the Democrats are going to lose in the midterms. And then they're also saying that Donald Trump is going to be running in uh, 2024 and talking about it like it's happening. Whereas what they could be doing and what we would have done in the British media is we would be shaming him. So, you know, even with our kind of unbiased uh, news gathering, we would say it's not possible for him to run because there's all these cases against him. He tried to overturn the last election. Of course he can't run. Yet every channel, including CNN and MSNBC and, you know, all of them, they're all saying, well, you know, likely that Donald Trump is going to run. And I'm like, wow, you are facilitating uh, this guy who's broken all of these campaign finance laws and and everything else. You're facilitating putting him in. You're encouraging him to to run. hundred percent. hundred percent. I think it's absolutely ludicrous that Donald Trump is continuously acknowledged as a legitimate political figure. I think, as far as I'm concerned, it ended, you know, very early on in his presidency. But January 6th, for God's sakes, was a red line. Yeah. This well, for me, it was the fourth day when he decided yeah. to ban all all, uh, all yep. uh, Muslims from coming yep. into America. And I was like, that's the day you impeach him on day four. You know, what? Yep. why wait? 
Yeah. And speaking of my my, you know, extraction from the Trump cult, that was actually that was one of those things. I mean, I I, I was re- registered Republican, but I was always a moderate. I mean, I was doing diversity engagement on that campaign, trying yeah. to make it more inclusive. And the Muslim ban, I always thought was just a campaign shtick. So, um, yeah, thank you, Trump, for doing that on day four to start to get me out of out of your um but it, it was a, it was a real thing. I had a Muslim friend in London who was oh, coming to, to New York and got stopped at Heathrow Airport, and they oh. were like, "You can't come in. You're not going to go. You, we're not. Let, we're not." Let. And there was, I mean, she was just a a girl. You it know? was devastating to so many families. I yes. mean, absolutely devastating, terrible. But yes, can we can we talk for a second about the uh, the three amigos because uh, I do find these characters kind of uh, very interesting. I always refer to John Eastman as the man in the hat. Um, and uh, I think, you know, you'll basically from the speech that he made on, on January 6th, you know, he looked like the witch finder general. Uh, well, they say an accelerating Justice Department investigation into the fake elector scheme to help Trump overturn the uh, election, plus explosive testimony from the January 6th hearings have has created intense legal heat for these uh, three lawyers. Jeffrey Clark, who we uh, saw in his underpants uh, standing outside his house while it was being raided by the FBI. Uh, Rudy Giuliani and uh, John Eastman, key players in the abortive efforts, say, ex-prosecutors. There's been a lot of criticism of, of the Justice Department and Merrick Garland for, like, you know, not making it clear who they're going after. But I'm starting to feel like, well, if they've gone for Jeffrey Clark in the middle of the night, then they're definitely on the Trump trail, aren't they? So do you, do you have faith in the fact that as this investigate or as this committee is investigating, you know, in, on, in, uh, on Capitol Hill, also there's another investigation that's going on at, at the DOJ? Um, I am extremely hopeful. I am extremely hopeful. Let's put it that way. I am extremely gratified by the work of this committee. And I do not think it is by any coincidence that these, these things are happening in tandem. Right. Um, the, the very public, um, outing of, of these efforts to overthrow, overturn the election, to overthrow our democracy and in tandem, the, uh, FBI and DOJ, making their moves. Um, I think it highlights how important it is to keep this narrative top of top of mind for the American people. Um, and I think it, it is showing what I have long believed that the, the, the Department of Justice needs public pressure. They need a showing of public interest. And that's going to go towards actually protecting on the back end when prosecution is brought. Because if the majority of the Mer- American people, as as it polls now show are in support of prosecution for Donald Trump. It's going to be a lot harder for um, any sort of, uh, you know, violent pushback or pushback at all to to have any sort of oxygen um, in the in the fallout of an indictment. So um, I think it's it's no coincidence that they're happening in tandem. And am I faith? Do I have faith in the DOJ? I am hopeful. I am grateful. And I, for one, am going to um, never drop this narrative until Donald Trump's indicted. So l- join me and let us all do that because it it is the key to saving our democracy. I mean, the what I find most interesting about this kind of uh, this whole plan that they had mm-hmm. is that they're actually quite proud of it. You know, Peter Navarro went on NBC and basically stood there in front of a backdrop with his hands, as he does, and just explains the whole thing, like super proud of it. Do you think that their mindset is that they are actually onto something, that there genuinely was fraud, that they actually believe that this is a thing? Because it's a very convincing. I mean, a lot of people say, including the chap who was the uh, the, the guy, the British guy who made the documentary about Trump, who's given evidence or handed over the documentary uh, to the to the panel. He said, you know, I'm convinced that Trump thinks that he did win the election and that he's surrounded by people that have told him that he won. And he no. is as aggrieved as he is because no. he thinks it's true. No, I am is, that, is that the case? No. No, I am. I'm grateful for that documentary and that documentarian. But I, I, I sharply disagree with him. 
Donald Trump knew exactly what he was doing. He knew he lost the election, period, yeah. end of story. Yeah. I will say this, I re I've repeated this on Midas many times, but I can never repeat it enough because it tells you all you need to know. Remember Bob Woodward interviewing Trump to write his book in 2020? Yeah. One of the things he said is, uh, you don't, um, Donald Trump said, you don't understand me. And Bob Woodward said, I think I understand you. And he said, no. You'll understand me after the election, okay? This man always had in his mind that he was going to do whatever it took to keep himself in power. Yeah. That's your mens rea. Well, the, the phrase that he used for. leading up even a year or two before the election was that if I don't win, it's because it was fraudulent. And he started sowing that so early on, even before there was any of these questions about voting machines or any of the, you know, or, or a bag stuffed with ballots under a table, all of this crap that they made up to kind of give legitimacy. And this goes back to this kind of gullible thing that I was talking about, you know, about some people in the U.S., just accepting that if somebody says something who's in authority, if they're wearing a suit or if they're, you know, on a pedestal, even the presidential pedestal, that it must be true. I mean, what is it about people's inability to have a kind of radar for what is true and not true? I mean, is it that we are just grow, we grow up just to be very trusting of, of the grown ups in the room? Well, um, as it pertains to Donald Trump, um, they have made him an idol. His followers right. have made an idol out of him. I, I happen to be Christian. First commandment of uh, the Judeo-Christian Decalogue, Jewish or Christian, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Well, all of the so-called Christian supporters of Donald Trump broke the first commandment years ago <laughs> because they have made this man their god. And he says that he was sent from God and others have said he was sent from God. And it's all... It, you know, it's just a it's he's not a godly person. There's yeah. that famous interview where he yeah. was asked about his favorite passages from the Bible. And he said, you know, it's very personal. I really don't want to quote anything. And it was like, you've never picked up a Bible I other know. than to stand outside a church know. after you've firebombed a whole bunch <laughs> of Americans to get there. Exactly. So let's talk about the religious connotation for a second. And I'm pleased that you say that you're a Christian because you know, Christianity in America, I've learned, is very different to Christianity in, in the UK. And in the UK, we are effectively a kind of secular society. You know, the, the, we have a head of state, Her Majesty the Queen. She, you know, she is the head of the church, and she therefore the government works for her. And it all has a kind of, it's connected to religion, but it isn't really, because nobody is religious. And in fact, most people in my years growing up and living in London and the UK, I, I don't think I ever met anybody that believed in God. <laughs> And, and and yet here we are, you know, I'm now in the United States and I've been proudly living here for a few years. And, you know, if, if somebody says they're a Christian, they're really a Christian, you know, and, and this is a very different experience for me. I'm fascinated. I don't know about that. Well, I, let's hear I, it because I, evangelical I, Christianity is the biggest religion in the U.S. Evangelical, right? right? Yeah, I define yeah. Christianity by living, living okay. the precepts. Of, of the master Christian Christ Jesus. If you're not living his precepts, sorry, you're not a Christian in my book. So this this brand of so-called evangelical Christianity that's that's uh, rampant in this United States and and um, furthering you know this first birth first birth for forced birth <laughs> yeah. tongue twister forced birth movement that's really a pro death movement. It's not yeah. a pro life movement. No. Um, that I find no foundation for in the in the Bible or the scriptures that I read whatsoever, um, give, given that I read what I consider to be the inspired word of the Bible. You can't take every word of the book literally. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that it, it underscores two platforms that I think have really been hijacked by the extreme right, Christianity and freedom. They claim to be they claim to be the champions of both of these, and they really just um, you know blaspheme both of them constantly. That is yeah. what they have done. They do not represent freedom. They do not represent Christianity. I mean, we can just let's just pick like one 
How about the gold rule? Do unto others. I mean, that's in the Bible. Do unto yeah. others as you would have others do unto you. They they uh, don't bear false witness against your neighbor. We were talking earlier about all the lies that they spread about Democrats. I mean, there's yeah. so many tenets of of Christianity that they violate. Oh, here's here's one of my favorites. Is this applies to the whole Bible guns and guns in the Bible? I mean, where did this concept come from? If they've ever read the Bible, it says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Our weapons are not carnal, folks. So you need an AR-15 to protect yourself. <laughs> but it's it's a tragedy that, that the religion, because I had a Christian friend here in the U.S. who, you know, went to church every week and w- was very much, a, you know, a, a, um, you know had, had Jesus in her heart. Yeah. And when Trump got in and started abusing this uh, rhetoric, Mm-hmm. she walked away from the church and she, she had to just give it up. She couldn't do it anymore. And she, you know, she moved from being a conservative to to um, really, you know, pushing for progressive rights and, and, and became a Democrat. And this is very interesting to me, you know, the hijacking of the church and the hijacking of, of Christianity. And now the Supreme Court, you know, hijacking Christianity in a way and, and you know, using it without the specific language, but basically making decisions based on one particular faith. I mean, as a Christian, how do you feel when the highest court in the land is is abusing the faith in this way? I'm appalled. I'm appalled. I mean, I just wonder, first of all, like you said, it's a hijacking of Christianity. It's their perverted extreme version of their interpretation, and particularly someone like Amy Comey Barrett, who is, um, as I understand it, a member of a very fundamentalist, um, you know, retrogressive interpretation of Christianity, a cult, as some have described it. So um, it's appalling. And I just wonder, I mean, our founding fathers, most of them were people of faith, yet Mm -hmm. they they founded this country um, after a a revolutionary war that was that was based upon separation of church and state, (laughs) freedom from a king, freedom from rule of church. And and we have a uh, establishment clause that says that that church and state are are there shall be no um, established religion from the government. So um, for them to to take some perverted interpretation of of so-called Christianity and make it um, legal, the legal standard that strips, um, in this case, uh, half of our population of their fundamental rights as human beings, um, not to mention all of the death and suffering that it's going to cause, is just absolutely egregious. Um, it's, it's undemocratic and it's, it's un-American. It's plain un-American. There's not much that Joe Biden can do, uh, as we know, other than pack the court, as some are saying. And, you know, I should remind people that there's nothing in the Constitution that says how many Supreme Court justices there can be. But, uh, you know, he's he's not really a kind of revolutionist, is he? He's not really the right man at the right. He was the right man at the right time to get elected. But in terms of like making significant changes, you know, he is very much institutionalized um, into the into the current system. But on Friday, he condemned what he called the the extreme Supreme Court majority that ended the right to abortion. And he delivered a, a plea for Americans upset by the decision to vote, 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 vote. I think there was four of them. Um, and so he's now signed this uh, executive order, which, I mean, again, it's a little bit like the the um, gun control bill from uh, last week that isn't really going to make a huge difference. This is, it, it's it's as much as he can do, isn't it, to kind of encourage the debate and to hopefully, um, you know, make the point that voting really is the only way that you can bring about change on this issue. Yeah, I think voting really is the way because there are always going to be be holes in executive orders. They're always going to come up against um, legal challenges. Yeah. Um, and there's some excellent things in that executive order, by the way. I mean, one of the ones that stood out to me is pro bono legal assistance for women that are facing um, facing these these assaults on their rights in certain states. Um, and and we know that they are going to need legal help. I mean, there mm. some of some women could t- potentially be charged with crimes for um, trying to abort 
a child that um, or a, a fetus of a rapist, you know, that a rapist yeah. um, impregnated them with. So, um, and that- we saw the story this week of a, of a, of a ten-year-old girl who, yes. who was who was raped and yeah. you know had to go out of state to get an abortion. But you know, even that example has been put to Republicans. And they they still are unable to engage on it. It's and I mean that's the interesting thing is that there is no engagement. I mean I would love to be able to do a show where I just talked to Republicans, but Republicans will not put themselves up for interview. They just you know lawmakers I'm referring to. They just they won't engage unless they're on a right wing propaganda channel. And I mean I, I would enjoy it. And I actually went on a, a British channel uh, last week and, and, and made a, an argument against a, a kind of far right extremist host. And I think I won. I think I won the de- won the sure debate. Did. I'm sure but but it, it, it's very important that we engage and the, the, even they refer to kind of debate something in Congress. Well, there is no debate, not as as it is where I come from. You've seen debate in British Parliament. That's like a slagging match. That yeah. really is a face off. <laughs> And that that is how stuff gets done. But people just make statements in Congress and in the Senate, don't they? There there is no debate. No. And, you know, I mean, this is what Mitch McConnell does. He doesn't even everybody thinks that um, it's he's shutting down particular issues. He's not even doing that. He's tabling. He's tabling all of these. So they're not even brought up for debate, as you're saying. I mean, just one issue after another is tabled. It never even gets to the point of a vote because it has not passed that threshold of, like you said, having a debate. But I wanted to just go back to one thing you said about Biden. You said vote, vote, vote. I agree. We need to vote, vote, vote. But as as you were saying, he's an institutionalist. Look at just where he has moved in the past week. I mean, this we didn't even expect this executive order and where he has moved on the filibuster, saying he's in favor of filibuster yeah. carve out for codifying Roe. This just shows the importance of public outcry, of of public engagement and pressure. Um Maybe some of our Democratic leaders are not as forceful or energized as some of us would like them to be. We have a role. And and Joe Biden, I think, deserves a lot of credit for for um, reacting to the will um, and the desire of, of the people for him to act and to move more progressively on certain issues. Let's uh, finally talk about uh... Prime Minister Boris Johnson in the UK, a man that I never experienced as Prime Minister because I wasn't living in the UK you know, in the last three years since he's had this job. And I'm very pleased about that because I think the guy is one of the worst people to grace number 10 Downing Street. Um, uh, he finally resigned on Thursday, announced his decision to step down after days of high profile government resignations. I think it was nearly 50 ministers resigned 40 on one day, another 10 on another day. I mean, he, he almost had nobody to choose from if he was, you know, to form a new cabinet. Um, but the tragedy was that, you know, when he got up to kind of make a speech and, and say that he's been forced to resign, he still didn't concede that he'd done bad stuff. He still refused to accept that his lying and his corruption and he and his, I mean, the garbage that comes out of his face, you know, he has no attention to detail, very similar to Donald Trump in so many ways. I I would say that, you know, we're we're more of a civilized society in the UK. You know, we don't have guns. We don't have gun crime. The police don't even have guns in the UK. I often say that on this show and and people are like, uh, how? (laughs) But it is possible. And, you know, we've seen the similar thing in, in Japan. But I feel like a civilized society requires you to have a a leader who is also civilized themselves. And Boris Johnson is not a a civilized person. You know, he has always caused chaos wherever he's been. And I was in his orbit when he was the mayor of London, and he made an absolute disaster of that job. I mean, nobody wanted to work with him, again, because it was all about him. You know, he just wanted to make sure that in whatever situation he looked good, and if he had to lie in order to achieve that, then that was all he knew how to how, how to kind of conduct himself. And it's the same with Trump, isn't it? Does Trump know how not to lie? You know, because my my kind of lie radar is pretty good. I, I get a kind of hairs on the back of my neck. I can really feel when someone is just like talking out of their backside. And I, I got that permanently with, with Boris Johnson. But, you know, do you think people like Johnson and Trump have the ability to go straight you know if they if they if they went into some kind of rehabilitation program do you think they could come out as good people 
Yes. Well, I think, first of all, I think Boris Johnson, as much as you have personal experience with him, I'm going to give him a tad more credit than Trump. But yes, I'm sure the, the Trump came out in him the other day and in, in doubling yeah. down. Right. Yeah. But but what's that rehabilitation program? I am so glad you asked me, Anthony. You know what it's called? It's called penitentiary. Ah, yes. Penitentiary. yes. The, the orange jumpsuit. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> this is, it's good yes, enough for all. But does he? Do, no, you are right. Donald Trump has been living a lie his whole life life. That's why he couldn't even admit that when he, you know, put the wrong circle with a Sharpie on a map, that it was wrong. Because yeah. he can't, if he admits the smallest lies, his his basically, his entire cover comes down. This man needs the truth. He needs the truth. He needs this criminal indictment. Let's just, like we were talking about, you know, when we started this conversation, it's not political, it's human, it's social, right? Living a lie is miserable, isn't it? I mean, we've all at some point experienced some version of this where we're not being yeah, constantly looking over your shoulder. You know, you're I not think being it's honest that... with yourself. It's a yeah. miserable yeah. state of being. Donald Trump yeah. is a miserable man. If this man is finally given the truth, put in a penitentiary. What does penitentiary come from? Penitence, right? Thought, repentance. Finally forced to do the one thing that nobody has loved this poor man enough to do his whole life. This is going to be the greatest gift he's never been given, right? Finally, to face the truth, to get to know who are you, Donald Trump, for the yeah. first time in your 70 plus years to, to get a taste of real identity. Um, so, yeah, that's the rehabilitation program. It's it's called it's called justice. <laughs> and I feel just to bring it back to Boris Johnson just for a second, you know, I feel like um, this populism that enables leaders like this, you know, to give somebody a chance to vote for somebody because they're good value on television, you know, because they are they are comedic or entertaining or they can, you know, they can answer with a... They're charismatic, and that's the tragedy. You know, you look back through history, many of the great dictators were also very charismatic. They were very convincing. Yes. And yet their kind of personal desire was... It was all about themselves. It was it was this narcissism. And, you know, we talk about Trump as a malignant narcissist. And there's a there's a huge amount of narcissism in Boris Johnson, despite the fact that he, you know, purposely has messy hair and messes it up even more before he goes into an interview, because that's his trick. It's it's disarming. You know, it's the it's the Trojan horse. He likes to kind of get inside and then cause the chaos. And I, I feel like we are in danger, humanity is in danger of continuing to elect these characters who might be good value and we might be able to connect with them because they are personable. And, you know, let's be honest, politicians are boring. You know, regular career politicians are boring. And, and you know, Biden is, is, is no great entertainer. Mm-hmm. Although he did pretty well at the, uh, at the, at the press dinner. Press I was dinner. kind of impressed yeah. with him there. But, <laughs> but, you know, Trump is better at those debates. Trump, you know, has the floor. He knows how to use the camera. He's a very clever operator. And Boris Johnson is exactly the same. These people understand the theatre of politics. They just don't have any policies. You know, they often don't even have a political allegiance. As we know, Trump and Johnson have kind of gone wherever is most likely to get them votes. And they'll say anything to get elected. So how do we go forward? You know, I'm thinking about who follows Boris Johnson, but I'm also thinking about who follows Trump if he doesn't run. You know, the the DeSantis's or any of these characters who might know how to put on a good show, but actually their intention is 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 not honorable. Yeah. Uh, well, a couple things you hit on there. I mean, first of all, is is the the pop culture crisis that we have where we just we indulge in these larger than life figures. Um, I. You know, I, I fell into this, too. It's such it's such a shameful admission. I am an educated woman. Um, but that The Apprentice, The Apprentice had a big impact on me. It really did. It legitimized this man for me. It made me believe that he was a legitimate, successful businessman. It is, And it's not even real. It's not a no, real show. The whole thing is fake. No, it's just it's imagery. It's imagery. Yeah. And it's. Um, we have to be really alert to this. You started off talking about, uh, you know, how how the Brits are more savvy when it comes to consumer culture. But this is 
this is a real crisis. I mean, we have to really guard our thought. I, I described um, what, what Fox News is doing as mental malpractice. And um, mental malpractice comes to us in so many forms. Um, I think it, it just shows how alert we really have to be. I most certainly have had that retrospection in, in my experience um, and just seeing all of those red flags that I missed and the things that I bought into that I knew better than and that I shouldn't have. Um, so we, yeah, we really need to, we re really need to heighten our alert, to heighten um, our, our senses and, and um, be on guard because yes, there are, people don't like to call Trump a wolf in sheep's clothing, but I think he is a version, he is definitely a version of a wolf in sheep's clothing. Like you said, Boris Johnson uses the hair as a disarmament. There are these disarmament tactics and Trump has a ton of them himself. Um, a DeSantis will as well. Um, and and these people, their underlying objectives, especially with the Trump and DeSantis, are fascists. I mean, these are fascists. Yeah. We can we do. It is not too extreme to make comparisons to Hitler. This man was an extremely charismatic figure yeah. who had a populist following. Um, and and, um, you know, they did not see the signs and handle them soon enough. We are we are dealing with the same the same level of urgency now. Okay. Jessica, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate your insight and, uh, and well done for seeing the light in, in so you. many ways. <laughs> uh, I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to subscribe to The Weekend Show on YouTube or as an audio podcast and also the 5 Minute News daily podcast, which drops every morning so you can listen while you make your morning coffee and leave an iTunes review. Join me next week with a brand new special guest and three more factual news stories to discuss on the 5-Minute News weekend show with Midas Touch. <laughs>